Hello and welcome. This is Borsch uh, from Extinction Rebellion, and this is the talk which is called Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. Uh, I will try to be as brief as possible uh, delivering this talk to you uh, at this time when rebellion is happening in London in uh, late August of 2021. And this talk has evolved a lot through uh, the ages, so if you've seen earlier versions, it might be worth looking at this version as well. It addresses mainly three things. Number one, what are the issues? Why are we here? Number two, what can we do? And number three, why should you join Extinction Rebellion? I must assume that if you're here to watch and listen for the next half an hour, then you are interested in joining, and I urge you to do so. And with that, we move on to the next slide. Now, uh, I will talk more about Extinction Rebellion in a moment, but uh, for now, just very briefly, one slide of introduction. We are what we call a nonviolent direct action civil protest movement. We are everyday people, average people, just like you. Uh, we're looking for a solution to the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. And we have understood that individual action will not be sufficient to tackle these two. And therefore, we are urging our governments and corporations, international organizations, both here in the UK and internationally to take action on our behalf. They must support us and they must protect us as governments have done, uh, 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 pledged to do when they came to power. Now, as you watch this video, uh, you might experience a range of different emotions as we go through. And some of these are negative emotions, shock, denial, grief, numbness, anger, but also, uh, as I have done when I first watched this video uh, um, for the, uh, with this uh, talk for the first time, I experienced relief because I felt agency for the first time. I felt like I could, there's something I could do. And so these are all appropriate emotions to be feeling. And But people who join Extinction Rebellion typically find this experience somewhat therapeutic. Uh, we're a large group of like-minded individuals and we're all working towards the same goals and this feeling of agency can help us uh, to feel less shock and less grief, although we do experience that from time to time. Now, before we go into the climate and ecological crisis, I want to stress that the world's most pressing problems are very closely linked together. All of these things that end with justice, economic justice, environmental justice, gender justice, social justice, racial justice, and climate justice, uh, all of those are linked by this one uh, word in the middle, power. Power, which is both financial and governmental, is concentrated in the hands of a teeny tiny minority. Think about political leaders, uh, think about global corporations, the financial institutions that finance these, uh, the mega rich. Um, the people with uh, this power tend not to care too much about uh, the damage they do to the earth, uh, and they perpetuate gross inequalities. And I like to say that uh, Solving climate justice doesn't work without solving racial justice, um, environmental justice, economic justice, and but they all go hand in hand. And if you start solving one, you are also at the same time solving the other. Even industrial uh, nations such as ours, people of color are more likely to be dying of COVID, much more so. Uh, people are, of color are more dispar are disproportionately affected by air pollution. Uh, they have a lower life expectancy less access to education, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, our movement is primarily a, prim uh, a um, climate movement, but we stand together with Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter with the LGBTQI plus uh, movement, refugee rights, all the rest of it, it all hangs together and, and um, we go hand in hand. Let's go to the climate crisis first. And uh, this is our focus today. We've got this one planet, it's a beautiful planet that is becoming less and less beautiful, but it is our only life support system and don't let anybody else, anybody tell you otherwise. Um, everything we need is in here, uh, the air, the food, the water, and uh, the ground that we build our homes on. Uh, it is a complex system and there isn't another one of uh, these systems, which is why uh, people say there is no planet B. You might have seen that on a placard before. Well, there isn't. And if we destroy it, there is nowhere else to go. And no matter how many rockets uh, Elon Musk uh, is going to build and try to colonize Mars or Moon, the Moon or whatever. Um, it's not going to work. We have a planet which is currently still reasonably um, habitable, less and less so 
uh, let's try to keep this habitable rather than trying to make another extremely hostile place habitable. That's, that's how I look at it. But instead of doing that, we're causing damage to it. And we're causing damage to it in multiple different ways. But the two main ways that are really important to sort out in the short term are climate destruction and ecological destruction. Um, the climate crisis is caused by mainly by burning fossil fuels and the way that we use land. We'll get some detail about that in a minute. The ecological uh, crisis is caused by the growth of consumption and mainly by the rich minority. So if you think um, uh, global population is an issue, yes, it is an issue, but uh, the vast majority of this consumption, this overconsumption is done in the global north by a small minority of rich nations and rich people within rich nations. Uh, these impacts are now, this is not into the future. It's clear and uncontroversial science. Uh, us, our children and our grandchildren are facing catastrophe if we don't reverse uh, what we're doing and where we're going. Governments and corporations are knowingly not doing enough um, to halt this crisis. Instead, they're spreading myths about net zero targets long way into the future, basically kicking the can down the road. Um, and whilst they at the same time continue to subsidize fossil fuels and paying massive agricultural uh, companies money to destroy our land. Um, let's, let's look at uh, what this looks like in practice. And I promise not to show you any more squiggly lines other than this one, but this is pretty critical. Um, and this chart shows global average temperatures and global uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over time in the past couple of thousand years. And uh, it shows that in the last 2000 years, th that's the red line, um, the CO2 concentration has been uh, reasonably flat. Uh, but since the Industrial Revolution, it has become exponentially higher and higher and higher. And the blue squiggly line on the right hand side of the chart um, shows you actual temperature records, which are very closely matching the, um, the CO2 curve uh, at the same place. And, uh, Scientists have spent decades debating and trying to find out if there's any other cause other than rising CO2 levels to the rising of the temperatures and all the other causes have been uh, substantially ruled out. So we started around 280 parts per million uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Now we're kind of at uh, 420 and uh, by, um, by 2050, we might be looking at 500. Uh, we are currently already at 1.2 degrees of temperature rise above industrial pre-industrial um, average. And we're heading for two degrees by mid-century, three or more degrees by the end of the century. Uh, but uh, although these numbers don't sound like much to some of us, uh, they actually signify catastrophe for the planet. Now, a very simple uh, graph to show you, this is, we didn't come up with this, this is, uh, um, uh, propagated by the BBC, and it is the bathtub analogy. It, it, it shows you why just reducing emissions is not enough. So if you look at the bathtub, the water that, that's already in the bathtub is the, the concentration of carbon dioxide inside the atmosphere, which accumulates, accumulates over time, and that's already in there. Um, now, the tap that you see on the left-hand side is the emissions that we add to what's already in the atmosphere year on year on year. So if you slow down, you can see that if you slow down the tap, you're not actually reducing the water in the bath. You are increasing the water in the bath because you haven't switched the tap off and you haven't drained the bath. So just to give you an example, in the lockdown year of 2020, we slowed the tap down by about 6 or 7%, which means we've still added 93% of the carbon to the bath that we have done in the year before in 2019. Net zero, when we talk about net zero, that means stopping the bath water rising any further, turning the tap off completely. That's net zero. And we need to be, uh, reach net zero. And people talk about net zero by 2050, which is way too late, but I'll come back, uh, come back to this um, slump somewhat later. Uh, that's all I wanted to say about the climate uh, um, for now. There's a lot more to come, but, uh, but that's the very basic science of it. Um, climate chaos is of course only one half of the problem. The other half of the problem is the an, um, ecological crisis. And according to the Secretary uh, General Antonio Guterres uh, of the United Nations, humanity is waging a war on nature and humanity, uh, human activity is causing a mass extinction of animals. 
apparently up to a million species are endangered. And this is uh, an extinction which is caused by exploding human consumption, not natural events, and which is why it's better called an extermination. We are knowingly doing it, and the world has failed to meet a single target on stopping the destruction of nature. The consequences of global uh, warming and, and the ecological um, destruction are very severe, and they fit into three different but linked categories. Uh, one of them is uh, climate consequences. So how does the climate change? Uh, ecological consequences, and of course, human consequences as well. Now, uh, the climate crisis, as I've mentioned, is not something that's uh, a bad thing that may or may not happen into the distant future. It is bad, and it is happening right now. And at 1.2 degrees of warming, and I'd like to um, call your attention to the fact that actually um, about a third of the global human population are already experiencing warming of more than 1.5. 1.5 is the target for the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Well, one third of human population is already there today. Um, now, we are in deeper trouble than we thought we were. And every time a new report comes out, it's always bad news, but not just continuous bad news, it's perpetually worse and worse news. So what does actual climate disaster mean? Um, disaster means in this, um, in the, the instance of this planet is, is what climate scientists uh, like myself uh, like to call chaotic water regimes. Too much water, not enough water, very dry and hot conditions and extremely wet conditions. So the four images you see here, drought, wildfire, floods and sea level rise. Uh, according to uh, former UN uh, climate chief, uh, Christina Figueres, this is a quote, this means that future generations will have to live in a world that is so unstable that it will be very difficult for them to have any predictability about their life whatsoever. We've known this for a long time, and the people responsible for emitting these uh, 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 carbon emissions have known for 40, sometimes 50 years. Um, everything is getting worse. The droughts are getting worse. The wildfires are getting worse. Sea level rise is getting worse. Floods are getting worse. Uh, we know all these. You know, Siberia, the Amazon, California, Australia, all the wildfires, but also in the UK. Glaciers are melting, causing sea level rise, causing coastal extreme events. Um, and uh, worst case scenario for sea level rise by the end of uh, the centuries up to two meters, which would mean places like New York City, Amsterdam, Dhaka in Bangladesh. Um, what else? Um, definitely Miami and pretty much uh, the lower bit of, of Florida. Um, Tokyo. All of these places are right on the sea level and they will be uh, disappearing or being very, very difficult to protect, possibly having to move uh, inland. Um, about 350 million people living on coasts uh, will have to be um, relocated at that point. Now, we it's one thing to say I like animals and they're so cute and cuddly and fluffy but we are critically dependent on, on the natural systems of the earth. We can't just displace them with, with crops. Um, and yet the earth has lost the capacity to sustain the current and future human well-being. The carrying capacity of this planet is quite large if we use it well and right. Uh, but biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate and the pressures driving this decline are actually not reducing it. They are in, uh, intensifying. Um, there's a thing called the background extinction rate uh, and we are about up to a thousand times higher in extinction rate than the background should be, which is the normal average on, the, on planet Earth, if you take out the human factor. Uh, there's a, a thing called the uh, Living Planet Index, uh, which is a global index of what's going on uh, around the planet. And on average, it appears that there's a decrease of over two thirds in the population of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish between 1970 in 2016, we're becoming a barren planet very, very quickly. Even if you don't notice because you look out the window and you see that the trees are still there and there's birds are still singing, this is what's happening across the globe. And as a result of our actions today, our children are experiencing and inheriting a much reduced world in which natural landscapes will be uh, increasingly rare. Wild animals and insects are becoming hard to find and most of life is actually lived in a separation from nature, which I find terrifying. 
And if the climate and ecological consequences weren't enough, there is the human impact, of course. Let's imagine for a second that it's 2050, which isn't all that far away now. And the world is about two degrees warmer, which is highly likely. Uh, things will change beyond recognition and in ways we can't even imagine yet. Life uh, in the way that we are accustomed to thinking about it will have ended. At this imaginary point in time, only 29 years into the future, billions of people will be living in unbearable heat. Billions of people will be chronically short of water. Up to a billion people around the world will have had to abandon their homes and move somewhere safer, if they can find somewhere safer where the people already living there are kind enough to accept them. That, in my mind, may be the biggest if in the history of mankind. And of course, as I mentioned, hundreds of millions will be living in constant flooding, including the UK as well, where about uh, a million people are expected to be uh, living in extremely flood-prone uh, places. Now, in 2015, in Paris, all nations agreed that global warming was already causing a wide range of serious effects. World leaders, such as these ones, um, have agreed that anything beyond two degrees must be avoided, and they committed to actually trying to aim for 1.5. A report since then came out which really reinforced this and said that two degrees could cause a serious disaster. In spite of this, uh, leaders everywhere continue to promise and fail to deliver, and we are literally drowning in these promises. Uh, globally, for over 30 years, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has provided scientific evidence to governments that in endless debates and conferences, this year we have COP26, the Conference of Parties in Glasgow, and that's the 26th conference they've had, lots of agreements, lots of fine words, Copenhagen 20. Uh, 2009, uh, Rio summit, uh, 1988, I think, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, 1995, all that stuff. Nationally, in countries around the world, there have been some legislation and initiatives from emission standards to carbon trading, and green home schemes. And of course, we've had environmental campaign groups as well, such as Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, these campaign groups, some of them are 50, 60, 70, 100 years old. Sierra Club is over 100 years old. And in addition to that, we've also had legal action, which less people, fewer people know about. Um, we've had um, over 1,000 lawsuits in uh, 28 countries where um, governments have been sued over their uh, inaction on the climate. And yet, nothing has worked. If you remember the hockey stick I uh, showed you, uh, the, uh, that, that graph, which is called the hockey stick, um, well, we saw the temperatures as well as CO2 levels skyrocketing. This is the same graph, just the end bit. Um, and here are some of the landmarks that, that uh, we have gone through to try and control um, emissions. And um, it seems to be the case that none of this stuff has done anything to bend that curve downwards. So uh, in fact, uh, since the formation of the IPCC in 1988, we have emitted more CO2 knowingly, knowing that there's a problem, than all of our CO2 emissions previous to that date. Uh, when leaders tell you that we're making progress, just take a look at this graph. If this graph continues exponentially growing, then they are, there's no, it doesn't matter how many things we're doing, we are still failing. This graph needs to go completely flat. That's the equivalent of net zero. And unless the curve begins to bend, we are continuously failing. Now, our leaders, and you may have heard this, uh, the new recent pledges from Boris Johnson, the G7, China, Joe Biden, all the rest of these guys uh, are saying that we're going to be lowering emissions. Every reduction in emissions is fantastic and is welcome, but you mustn't be fooled into thinking that they are going nearly far enough and fast enough to avoid this disaster. Uh, this is the chart that explains that to you. You can see three bits of information here, and the first one is the 1.5 temperature goal of the, uh, of the Paris Agreement. Now, then you've got the second one, which shows uh, the range of temperature increase based on the newest round of pledges. So the central estimate here is 2.4 degrees, uh, and if that's based on what uh, governments have pledged to do. 2.4 degrees we know is a disaster. We mustn't go beyond two and we really should be aiming for 1.5. 2.4 is terrible for us and yet this is the best promise that they have made so far. But what's really important is number three, 
which is the range uh, uh, of the, the gulf between what is being pledged or promised and what is actually uh, being delivered based on policy that's being implemented. So on that basis, we're looking at a central estimate of 2.9, but potentially up to uh, four degrees of warming uh, by the end of the century. And actually, one of the things that I really don't understand is why do we only go up to the end of the century? It's as if history and, uh, and the human race ends in 2100. What about everything beyond that? But anyway, by the end of the century, sorry about rant over, um, four degrees, 2.9 to four degrees, that's terrifying. And we're looking at irreversible damage, which is exactly what the IPCC's most recent report has said. It's um, irreversible, irreversible damage. And so that's the trajectory that they've uh, put us on. And if anybody is under any illusion that we can trust world readers to, uh, leaders to convert these pledges into action, uh, we could just look at the UK track record. And uh, politicians in the UK absolutely love saying how we've lowered our carbon emissions. But actually, the government's very own climate change committee says that the UK is missing its legal targets to cut emissions and has failed on 80% of progress indicators and is failing ever further and falling ever further behind. Um, 31 policy milestones, only two of them have been met over the past year. So don't believe the hype. And at the same time, government pledges uh, are being made. Uh, but they are actually making the climate crisis worse, not better. They are still investing in more fossil fuels, and they're still investing more in fossil fuels than into clean energy. Um, between January 2020 and March 2021, G7 nations committed more than $189 billion to support coal, oil, and gas far more than they do into clean forms of energy. And if governments are serious about their climate commitments, they really must stop new investments in fossil fuels now, which is why we are in, on the streets uh, today and these next few weeks. Uh, in spite of all the rhetoric, the UK government still spends more on supporting fossil fuels than renewable energy. And in the city of London, UK financial institutions alone are responsible for more carbon emissions than the whole of Germany. If UK financial institutions were a country, they would rank as the eighth largest emitter in the world. This kind of spending is just, there's nothing in here that is compatible with the goal of 1.5. And it is a brutal and, and criminal activity. And so we can see that um, business as usual is just not an option. The physics of cumulative emissions is cruel uh, because the CO2 that we've already dumped into the atmosphere uh, we have a budget, we have a limited finite budget. The world is already in a climate emergency and very close to catastrophe. An incremental change is not going to do it, even uh, or even slow down global warming. We have baked into the system this rapid uh, warming and therefore any rapid and transform only rapid and transformational change is going to make a difference. Um, to stand a reasonable chance of staying below 1.5 degrees of warming, uh, we have to reach net zero within the next five years. You can see how that's different to uh, by 2050. You just can't put it off. You need action right now. And only structural change will stop or, or slow down global warming. But what we're seeing instead is we keep going in the wrong direction. Despite the changes in rhetoric, which we have seen, nothing meaningful has actually been done. Words and paper do not replace action. The world is still in complete climate denial. The carbon dioxide curve keeps going up as we have seen. Now, the scientific evidence is crystal clear and the change must come from the powerful. Uh, lifestyle and other personal changes from individuals such as yourself and me, even from large numbers of people completely misunderstands the scale of the challenge. In fact, the idea of your own personal carbon footprint was dreamed up as a PR campaign for BP the same company that gave us the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, and it was uh, come up with by, um, by the advertising um, giant Ogilvy. Um, they're trying to put the responsibility onto individuals while organizations such as BP, uh, who could make a real meaningful change by changing you know, their product, uh, continue to extract extraordinary amounts of oil, gas, as well as profit. They're trying to distract you with the carbon footprinting. An individual action is false hope because 
uh, our own personal actions are great and they reduce harm to the environment and they are right and they model the world in which we want to live. Um, to believe that they are enough is to fundamentally misunderstand the scale and the source of the catastrophe. Let's be clear, we will never tackle the climate crisis with individual action and we will never tackle the ecological crisis with individual action. Most of the CO2 is emitted on our behalf entirely outside of our control. Like major emission sources such as electricity generation, airports, shipping, agriculture, heavy industry, they're all outside our control. Who controls these? Corporations and governments do. Deforestation, exploitative fishing, peat bogs and mangrove destruction, these things are really critical for, uh, for our environment. And the vast deserts of monoculture farming, they're also outside of our control. The extraordinary habitat destruction for agricultural lands to support soaring meat consumption, primarily by the global north, is a predominant cause of ecocide and also outside of our control. So even though you can stop eating meat or eat less meat, uh, it's not going to cut the mustard. Uh, by far, the biggest thing you personally can do to tackle the climate and ecological dual crises is by being more politically engaged because we need governments to take action on our behalf. And the question you might ask is, well, how the hell did we get here? Uh, how did we get to a place where we're at danger of destroying our one and only planet uh, with governments who fail to act in our best interests? Well, um, I want to mention three things to you. Number one, our electoral system. Um, you know that any elected polit politician finds it very difficult to think 10, 20, 30, or even 100 years ahead. That's not entirely their fault because partly it's the way in which the system works. If, um, if uh, you want to get reelected, you cannot uh, stand on an election on highly uh, unpopular uh, policies. It is what Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, calls the tragedy of the horizon. And the second problem is this constant demand for growth Capitalism has helped to create the life that we uh, uh, enjoy here in the global north, uh, but capitalism has a few assumptions which they really shouldn't be making. Number one is that the environment is an endless source of materials free of charge, such as clean water and air and fertile soil. And also and at, at the same time that it is an endless sink of waste and pollution. It assumes that these resources are free uh, forever, uh, they're, they're, um, they're unlimited and they're, that, that waste has no consequences forever. But we know that's not the case and we are now using uh, about one and three quarters of the planet and which means we are basically using up the resources. We only have one planet, I don't know if you've noticed. And the third problem is that the citizen's voice is calling for action has been incapable of forcing change. It has, been, it has been drowned out by the money and the influence of vested interests. The global climate justice has been sacrificed for the sake of a tiny minority. Think about this, the top five oil producers alone, and that's not a lot of companies, are spending about $200 million a year just on lobbying to delay carbon reduction. In contrast, uh, Extinction Rebellion uh, has a budget of about three million pounds a year. And so you can see that they outspend us by two orders of magnitude every single year. And that's just the top five companies. And it's not just the oil companies. Uh, lending to fossil fuel companies from banks is on the rise. So uh, in uh, 2019, we had $736 billion of lending um, and actually a total of $2.7 trillion since the promises in the Paris Agreement, uh, because bankers have the ear of governments too. And of course, the bulk of our press is also owned by six billionaire press barons in this country. And there's the same bunch of people, all these vested interests have no interest in climate action at all. We have a really small window of time and we say we are out of time. It's not too late to get meaningful action, but we are out of time. We are looking at the difference between a really terrible catastrophe and a somewhat lesser catastrophe. Those are our options now, and it is too late to, to avoid catastrophe, but that doesn't mean we should be paralyzed into inaction. We need to act now. And this, by the way, is a mural by a, um, an artist called Jane Mutiny and the mural is in Islington. And I personally wear another mural of um, Jane's here on my arm. 
uh, which is in uh, shortage. Um, so now, if we do nothing else, what is the one thing we must do? It is to stop fossil fuels from being extracted and used. We need to do this rapidly, entirely, and forever. I want you to say these three words like a mantra, rapidly, entirely, and forever. Everything else is secondary because if we don't do this, if we don't phase out fossil fuels rapidly, entirely, and forever, we will fail. It is that simple. Personal action, lifestyle changes on their own will fail. It is critical that our approach forces and convinces the powerful governments, international organizations, and corporations to change. And that is exactly what Extinction Rebellion is here to do. And let's be clear, it can be done. Uh, net zero fossil fuels is possible. Citizens around the world are crying out for action. The biggest global survey ever um, conducted by the UN found that despite all the misinformation, all the obfuscation, the vested interest, two thirds of us humans believe that the climate uh, emergency is a global emergency. But the will to make change from those with power only exists on paper. They need to decide to leave fossil fuels in the ground. They need to stop investing in harm. They need to go further and faster in greening our economy and to stop what is we call ecocide. There must be legislation, communication of the truth, incentives for dramatic change, and we must stop financial institutions from investing in destruction. We need the urgency, which we aren't seeing. Do you think protesting is so much fun? I mean, are we here just because we are a bunch of, oh, what did Boris Johnson call us? Uh, uncooperative crusties? You know, I would much rather get on with my life like everybody else, but there's nothing we have seen so far that tells us that we can safely go home and let the big guys handle it. If people fully understand, uh, understood the urgency, parliament squares around the world would be packed full of parents, terrified and petrified for their children, and daily newspaper front pages would carry climate emergency headlines exactly like they do with COVID. I wanna leave this slide with two um, quotes. Number one, from again, from Antonio Guterres, the secretary general of the UN, and the quote goes, climate change is the defining issue of our time, and we are at a defining moment. We need more concrete plans, more ambition, and more countries and more businesses. We need all financial institutions, public and private, to choose once and for all the green economy. And the second quote is by Nelson Mandela, who famously just said, it always seems impossible until it's done. So we are Extinction Rebellion. We have been called the fastest growing startup in history. We have a plan, and yet there are no guarantees. We stand together, not because we're certain that we will succeed, but because we're certain we must attempt to succeed. We felt that we were left with no choice but to rebel because all other avenues have been exhausted. And rebelling is the most important thing you can do. We all know we're driving towards the cliff edge. We understand the catastrophic risk. We know what, uh, what kind of place we're going to leave uh, for our children. We know that powerful vested interests are in charge and our representatives who say they are working on this are actually killing the planet. We know there's a moral imperative, don't you? There's a real duty to act, to take action. And so we invite you to step out of your comfort zone and do things that you've never done before. I personally, I'm not a rebel by nature. I rebel because I have to, I rebel. I've been told rebel and rebel are two different pronunciations. So here we are, this is for you, Suzanne. Um, so, you know, I'm not doing this because I'm, I'm naturally inclined that way. I'd much rather get on with my life and just do my work, raise my children, but I've been forced by the circumstances to, uh, to step out and take action. And traditional political engagement and clicktivism and signing petitions doesn't go far enough when the system is so obviously failing and so catas cat catastrophically so. So rebelling is the solution. And because we've seen that everything we've tried so far has failed, and uh, you know why now, and campaign groups in the past, they've had the right aims, but they just haven't succeeded. Look at the uh, atmospheric uh, carbon just keeps rising. It is clear, therefore, we need a new approach. We need to put real pressure to address the climate emergency, and it needs to come from a broad-based movement. Most of the climate um, action groups, such as Greenpeace, are small professional campaign organizations. We are a movement. We are big and we are um, here to build a mass movement. 
and that's uh, that's the XR strategy. We are you know, we are in front of this. The, the picture on the left hand side is uh, is the Proxmon uh, print works where we uh, occupied for a day in September 2020. And on the right uh, right you see uh, Palestinian children also holding up the XR logo. Um, we are everywhere on the globe. I will show you a picture shortly. But the question you might ask is, well, how does Extinction Rebellion think we might succeed when all these other efforts have failed? So before I get into Extinction Rebellion in detail, I want to look at the ingredients of a successful nonviolent civil resistance uh, movement. Well, the first thing uh, we need to say, and we've said it uh, time and again, is we are nonviolent. Uh, we say that when rules haven't worked, they must be broken, but always in a nonviolent way. This is because social science tells us that nonviolent resistance has a much higher chance of success. It is also morally right because we aren't violent people by nature. We're just everyday people. I, I am very, very unlikely to, to pick up a weapon, uh, but I'm very likely to put my body in, uh, in a, an inconvenient place. So nonviolence, firstly. Also, size is crucial. By being nonviolent, uh, we uh, lower the barrier of entry into uh, our movement. People find it much easier to imagine themselves joining because we are nonviolent. This will lead to a larger movement. Again, the science is clear that the larger, more diverse movements are more likely to succeed. This is because in order to achieve change, a movement must be able to generate leverage, pressure, and the bigger the movement, the more leverage we can generate. Also, diversity is crucial because the more types of people take part in the movement, the better it represents the overall society and the population, and therefore is more likely to be accepted and supported in wider society. As well, uh, more diversity brings more skills, and, and the movement we have here has fantastic uh, range of skills and, and the range of different uh, types of uh, people from all walks of life and joining. I will show you some um, slides about that too. Now, the third and final point about how might we succeed is about causing disruption and dilemmas to create pressure on a regime. Our instincts as good citizens is generally to obey the law. However, in order to get people's attention and get governments to engage, it is necessary to be disruptive. We are not here to be popular. We are here to be disruptive because we need governments to take, uh, take notice. Quietly offering leaflets, in a shopping center, that's been tried and it hasn't really worked. Being compliant hasn't worked. Allowing the big guys to get on with it hasn't worked. Historically, successful disruption has meant people putting themselves in other people's way, not just temporarily, uh, such as a protest march, which washes over and is very easy to ignore, uh, but in lasting ways, such as roadblocks, boycotts, strike action, hunger strikes, and the like. And before a regime engages, it often tries to suppress movements. We are detecting signs of this today. Uh, in many instances, uh, these attempts to, at repression do backfire and lead to even more sympathy for the movement. This is what we call a dilemma, because the regime can either choose to allow a disruption to continue or remove and arrest the participants. Both of these choices tend to increase awareness and potentially sympathy for the movement. So for a movement that wants to succeed, uh, uh, such dilemmas uh, are important uh, uh, to present to those in power. Um, the protest, of course, needs to be focused on where the power is. So, for example, in London, where the government, the banks and the climate obfuscating so-called think tanks are based, and we've visited them all. And finally, of course, the resistance needs to be prolonged. We've only been around for a couple of years, two and a half years. And change doesn't occur overnight, and so a movement needs to be uh, quite resilient or it will fizzle out over time, as we saw, for example, with the Occupy uh, movement. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that we're not going anywhere, and this movement is going to continue until necessary. We all want to go home, but only one when it's safe to do so. Extinction Rebellion follows in the footsteps and learns from every great moral movement that has advanced the cause of justice in the past. For example, India's independence movement, or the women's suffrage, the abolition movement, civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, South Africa, the LGBTQ movement. Every single one of these movements, the common theme is they've all met with some kind of resistance, typically quite a, a large amount of resistance. And just like those movements, we seek the tipping point where positive change not only becomes possible, it becomes inevitable. And so here are our demands. 
it is very easy to explain what we want. We've got three big clear demands. The first one is for governments and media to tell the truth about the situation we're in. Uh, that means the kind of information we covered in the first part of the talk, so about the climate and ecological emergency. And the government must declare a climate and ecological emergency and work with the media and other organizations to communicate that urgency for change and for global climate justice. Number two, we demand that governments must act now to halt biodiversity loss and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero as soon as possible, and even to not just net zero, to zero. Net zero uh, leaves the door open uh, for emissions to uh, appear and be offset by other uh, means, but we, we need zero fossil really as soon as possible um, and by 2025, which is not that far away. This means having to put uh, economies on a, on a wartime footing and change things quite rapidly, just like we've seen with COVID, which tells us what's possible. And number three, we must go beyond politics. Uh, we demand that the governments create and be led by decisions of a citizen's assembly on climate ecological justice to decide how to act. Those are our demands. Our strategy has began to make a difference. 81% of the UK public now say we're facing a climate emergency, which has been a much, much lower figure just a couple of years ago. Our actions have drawn attention to the crisis and people are beginning to understand that the government is not telling the truth and that we have to act now. Now, here's an example. Ordinary citizens sitting on a jury have expressed their understanding of the actions of Extinction Rebellion activists. Um, in April 2019, uh, XR rebels uh, went into the headquarters of Shell Oil. They poured fake oil, glued themselves to the windows and blocked the doors, cracked several windows and painted the exterior with Shell knew. Uh, they did this because uh, reports have shown that Shell did know over 30 years ago about the terrible uh, effects of carbon emissions on the climate. Um, and to cover this up, Shell hired lobbyists to mislead the public and block action on fossil fuels for decades. Shell has also played a role in terrible crimes such as the murders of the Agoni Nine in Nigeria. Now, the jury delivered its not guilty verdict for each and every Extinction Rebellion defendant, despite the judge ruling that they had no defense under the law. This just shows uh, uh, and demonstrates the power, power of civil disobedience by shining a spotlight on the injustice, by telling the truth through our actions. We believe that people will understand why we are rising up and will join us to bring about change. And you'll want to know that we're already making some progress in two and a half years uh, XR has compelled legislation, shifted the public discourse on climate, climate ecological crisis through our creative, sustained, nonviolent protests all over the world. We have been in parliaments, banks, and other centers of power, and um, we are changing things. XR was the number one influencer at COP25, the previous uh, conference of the parties of the IPCC, and we are winning the argument. The UK Parliament, as well as three quarters of UK councils, have declared a climate emergency. But unfortunately, the hockey stick become, uh, remains the reality and there's still a huge amount of uh, things to do. We do not have this covered. We need more people and we need people like you. And so Extinction Rebellion needs you today. The fact that you've listened uh, to this recording so far means that you're probably sympathetic to our court, uh, uh, cause, uh, but your children, your grandchildren, as well as the people already needlessly and unjustly suffering and dying because of the climate related tragedies of today, they all need you to go beyond just sympathetic. They need you to go beyond your personal commitments. They need you to join XR and get active. Don't leave it for another day. Just like with the climate, every day matters. Join today. I'd like you to close your eyes for a second and I want you to think in your heart and in your mind to feel um, this moment. I urge you to join us, Extinction Rebellion, in this moment, now. And why should you join? A lot of people who are listening to this will have already done changes to your, uh, your own lives. Please don't stop what you're doing. It sends a good message, a positive message. It creates markets and it makes a difference. But the massive scale of the change uh, uh, we need, uh, it will come from civil protest. It will come from pressure on governments and organizations with the power to make systemic change. It will come from forcing central governments to pass legislation, provide green investment, 
It will come from banks withdrawing from financing fossil fuels and governments ending huge fossil fuel subsidies. It will come from uh, when fossil fuel companies are forced to leave their resources in the ground. In short, we hope it will come uh, from the pressure exerted by XR. And it might work. We can't be sure that it will work, but it is our best chance. We are already having far more success than has been achieved by traditional campaigning in the past. And we know that those acting on the climate and ecological emergency in an effective way do feel better. We create hope through the possibility of change by taking action. And our movement is hugely supported. It's a growing community and it feels great to connect with others who care and are deeply concerned about the same things as you are. So come and be part of that in any way that works for you. You can find meaning here. We've been born in a very extraordinary time, uh, one that we didn't choose. Now we find ourselves here and the question is, what do you want your life to be about? What is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And when you start to take action, you realize that you have more power and influence than you thought, that you, than you'd imagined. Um, and you also will find that you have a lot of capacity for love and forgiving. The coronavirus pandemic has shown us what's possible, how radical change can be done. We must seize this moment and now is the time to act. And look at this, our uh, movement has grown rapidly and new groups are popping up all the time. Uh, at the time of writing this presentation, but it has uh, actually been uh, more since then, we had uh, around 1200 local groups in 78 countries, I think it's 82 countries now, uh, and including over 450 groups in the UK alone. There will be a group nearby uh, to you, uh, and if there isn't one, you can also start one. And not only is there a group, but there's also an interest group for you. We're a completely broad-based movement. There is a place for you in XR. XR community groups include faith groups, profession groups, from lawyers to truck drivers, uh, ethnicity groups, sexual identity groups, and interest groups, you know, from cricketers to beekeepers. There's an XR grandparents, XR yogis, XR, XR social workers, and XR plumbers. There will be a group for you. And there also is uh, a whole range of things that you can do. Uh, to achieve our goals, we need all sorts of tasks done, and it's a diversity. I'm terrible at uh, artwork, but other people are great at it. I, I can give a talk like this, I can stand on the corner and uh, distribute leaf leaflets, um, but there are so many different things that we can do. There's hundreds of roles and activities that are begging for more people to come in and help uh, help the, the movement. And some of it, if, you, if you're someone who uh, dislikes being on the protest, you can be in the back office. You do not need to, uh, to put yourself in, in, uh, in any situation that you're uncomfortable with. Um, you can run a Facebook group, et cetera, et cetera. And, but we are a movement who are trying to do something powerful. And while there are many different roles within XR, we also need to highlight that we are a non-violent direct action movement, and that requires some people um, to be prepared to be arrested. It isn't for everyone, but we are an NVDA non-violent direct action movement, and it is key to our goals. And here's an example of such, you know, a harmless, kind person being arrested for uh, for putting her body in a place where it is unlawful to be, uh, in the name of a good cause. I want you to consider this. Are you joining us? Are you joining us now or will you have regrets later? Anyone who adheres to our principles and values is, for all intents and purposes, part of Extinction Rebellion. There is no membership fee. You don't need to wear a badge, although badges are pretty cool. Uh, you can join today and then you can message your local community group. You will find all of them uh, um, on uh, uh, extinctionrebellion.uk and then most of them you'll also find on Facebook. And I'm going to finish on this slide here uh, on how to join. You do not need permission to get involved. In fact, by having listened to this talk, you're probably already involved. You can visit the website, you can find all sorts of information, you can find all the events, um, uh, you can uh, take a picture of this uh, QR code that you can see on the uh, screen right now. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter. And, um, and if you want to know more about the data, the facts about uh, where this uh, life on planet Earth is uh, going, 
then you can read XR Scientist's fantastic document, which is called Emergency on Planet Earth, which is also available on our website. I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. Number one, do not believe for a second that if you've made your personal commitments, then you've, you can sit back and relax. Forcing government action is necessary. Personal commitments are necessary for modeling the world in which we want to live, but by themselves, they will not take us far enough. And number two, do not believe for a second that XR have got your back, that you can sit back and relax because we're acting on your behalf. We haven't got your back. We need people, lots more people. We need you. Your planet needs you. Life itself needs you. <laughs>